So, hello everyone. I'm Dan Liu. I work at Trello, and here I am today to talk about dependency injection. Um, for me, dependency injection is one of those phrases that I heard pretty early on in my career and then immediately shied away from because it sounds really complicated. Um, but it turns out it's actually incredibly simple, and if there were to be like a thesis to this talk, it's that you're already using dependency injection, um, and I just want to explain to you what exactly it is and how you can better take advantage of it now that you know that you're using it all over the place. So before we get into the topic of like what is dependency injection, let's talk about what a dependency is. And uh, very simply, it's just when one component of your app depends on another component of your app. Uh, and in fact, this like just happens all over the place in programming. You would have to create a trivially small program in order to not have any actual dependencies. Um, and one could probably argue that still like the monitor, or the keyboard, or input and output is still a dependency uh, of your program. So, for example, like you might have a data provider that provides your actual data objects, and that might depend on a database layer. Um, you might have an image loader that's loading all your images from the network, and that requires some sort of HTTP layer. Uh, you might be having some REST calls in your app, and again, that would depend on HTTP existing. Um, REST itself also may depend on a deserializer, so once you actually get the data from uh, your REST service, then you need to turn it into something you can actually work with on the system. So not only can one dependency be provided to multiple things, uh, multiple, uh, a single thing can re require multiple dependencies. Um, and then maybe if you're talking about a login screen, maybe it depends on all that stuff above. So that's a dependency, just so we're all on the same page. So now let's step into what is dependency injection. And my favorite quote on this is um, from a blog post to a guy named James Shore, where he wrote that dependency injection is a $25 term for a five cent concept. It, is, it sounds so incredibly complex, like that in dynamic programming, there's a whole bunch of terms that people like to come up with that sound way more complex than they actually are. So here it is in a nutshell. Here's a class that doesn't have dependency injection. So I have my example class, uh, inside it is a dependency, and in the constructor I create an instance of that dependency. Uh, below is an example of dependency injection. And the only difference between the two is where the dependency came from. In the top example, the dependency was created from the object itself. In the bottom example, the dependency was passed into the object. And that's all there is to it. It's just, was the dependency created by yourself, or was it given to you externally? And so, for example, uh, you can have constructor injection, where you're giving the uh, dependencies at the construction time. You can also have like method injection, so the dependency isn't set until you call some specific setter. And that's it. Like all of this talk that you've probably heard about Dagger and object graphs and all that stuff, like that, that's a much more complex case of dependency injection. The much simpler version is this. And the reason I say that probably everyone in the room is a programmer has used this before, at least an Android programmer, is because of something like, say, your basic view constructor. Your basic view constructor takes a context, ta-da, that's a dependency. The view requires the context to do all sorts of work within itself, and this is a case of constructor dependency injection. Woo. So then the question becomes, oh, whoops, I didn't let the, it's not playing, that's really sad. Here we go. <laughs> but why? Why do we care about this? This doesn't seem that fancy. Um, for this very simple version of dependency injection, you get two uh, really powerful things from it. One is that you can share dependencies. Uh, so for example, a pretty common dependency is an HTTP layer of some sort, probably OKHTTP OK in your case. Um, OKHTTP OK uses an HTTP connection pool because uh, connections are expensive and you want to keep reusing them if possible. And so for all the places in your app that's using HTTP, you want to share that one pool in multiple places. So in that case, it's much more useful to have dependency injection so you can share it all over the place. Uh, the other really powerful thing that you can do with dependency injection is that you can configure the dependencies externally. So my object that the dependencies uh, uh, my object that requires the dependency, um, it doesn't have to know how to configure its own dependencies. I can, as a programmer, configure the dependency and then pass it in. Uh, so a good example of that might be using a context theme wrapper. Because if you didn't know, like the, um, when you uh, style a view, a lot of the style attributes come from the theme, and the theme is stored in the context. 
Uh, and you can actually use what's known as a context theme wrapper to take a context and then wrap it with a new theme. So if you want a particular view to look different, um, you can slap a context theme wrapper on it and then in the constructor pass that wrapped context and it'll then use that new theme. And in fact, this is how AppCompat was able to backport all of the um, view level theming that seemed like it shouldn't be possible to backport because it was like a 5.0 feature or something like that. They managed to get it much further back because this feature's always been around. Uh, and, but this is really handy because now I can configure my context externally, say I wanted to have my theme as the base theme, and then pass it into a view. And the view doesn't have to know anything about what sort of styling I'm doing to it. So that's dependency injection in a nutshell. Um, what it often gets mixed up with is what's known as the dependency inversion principle, uh, which is one of the five like solid architecture things that Uncle Bob and a bunch of other people came up with back in the day. Um, and so a lot of the times when people talk about dependency injection, they are also referring to this implicitly because they get the two kind of mixed up. Uh, but really, we should be very precise with our language. The dependency inversion principle, when you look at it exactly, says that high-level modules should not depend on low-level modules. Both should depend on abstractions. Abstractions should not depend on details. Details should depend on abstractions. This is like super uninterpretable. Um, like I still would have trouble explaining what the dependency inversion principle is to someone based on just this text alone. So let's just ignore all that and go through an example. Um, an example taken from one of Uncle Bob's papers about what the dependency inversion principle is to understand uh, what all that text was actually trying to get to. Uh, so to go back to what dependencies are, again, I'm saying A depends on B. Another way to kind of frame that is to say that A is coupled to B. And uh, so the two pieces of code have to have some coupling point. And what the dependency inversion principle really gets at is how tightly these two are coupled together. Uh, because when they are tightly coupled, it makes it harder to modify the code, whereas if they're loosely coupled, it makes it much easier to modify the code. So let's go through an example where we say that we have uh, an application, and this application, uh, you type into a keyboard, and whatever you type into the keyboard gets printed out to a printer. So this is my application. If I were to write a very simple version of it, I might have three modules. I would have a module that tells me how to read a keyboard, a module that, tells me, uh, that allows me to write to a printer, and then I'd have some copy module that actually like, combines the two and creates the behavior that I want. And so it's very simple code. I just have a while loop that's saying, keep reading from the keyboard until it gets to some end of file uh, indicator, which would be minus one, and while I'm reading from it, I'll just keep writing to the printer. So while this code is very simple, it turns out it's very hard to modify. So for example, what if I want to have multiple options for where I want to read from? Maybe I don't always want to read from the keyboard. Maybe sometimes I want to read from the disk. Uh, well, a very naive version would be, let's have a configuration value in copy where I tell you what the input device will be. OK, now I need to constantly be checking like this enum. I guess you could also split this into like maybe some larger if and have multiple whiles. But it's still, it's, it's a pain. And you're going to have to repeat this code for every new type of input that you would want. Uh, the same exact pain happens if you want to, say, modify where you'd output, because maybe you don't want to always be printing out and wasting paper, especially while you're developing this, this program of yours. Um, so if I want to print out to the monitor sometimes, again, I might create an enum, allow some uh, external configuration. So you can imagine that this code would get very gnarly very quickly, especially if you wanted to both allow configuration of input device and output device. Another uh, problem is that these modules are so tightly coupled, it's hard to know what exactly I want to test in the read and write modules. Um, so I don't know which parts of the read and write modules are actually important to copy. Um, so there might be a whole bunch of methods inside of each of them, and I don't know which of them are actually important to the outside world. Uh, and even more importantly, there's like absolutely no way to test that copy actually works correctly. Because copy as it sits right now, is reading from a keyboard and writing to a printer. So in order to like truly test its capabilities, I'd have to come up with some mechanical robot that would type on the keyboard, and then I'd have to have a printer nearby and some scanner that can make sure that what's actually being printed on the paper is exactly what I was expecting. So there's absolutely no way to test copy. So this is where uh, dependency inversion comes into play. And we, uh, in what we do is we invert the normal dependencies that you'd expect, where instead of having copy and keyboard and printer all depending directly on each other, instead of what we do is we stick an interface in between. Uh, and the idea of the inversion here is that 
Instead of them directly coupled, now they both directly point to this interface in the middle. And so this would be implemented somewhere, something like this. Now I have an interface reader, an interface writer, and in copy, I'm passing in the reader and the writer. Now the logic is pretty much the same, but now I'm no longer tightly coupled to that particular implementation of the, of the keyboard reader and the printer writer. So why would we want to do this? Um, again, we get the same things that we got from dependency injection. We can share dependencies. Uh, you probably only have one keyboard hooked up to your computer. You probably only have one printer hooked up to your computer. You'd want to be able to share that amongst multiple parts of your application. Again, you can configure dependencies externally. Uh, and this is extremely useful now because uh, what happens is I can pass any sort of reader or writer into my copy module. So I don't, have to have, I don't have to have it be a keyboard reader. I can also make a disk reader. And as long as that also implements the reader interface, I can use that. And the same with the printer writer, as long as I implement the, that writer interface, I can use any sort of writer that I want. Uh, and so now my copy module, the logic is simple. It stays the same regardless of whatever implementation I pass in. So if I want to not add a new reader device, just a new interface implementation, I don't have to actually go modify copy itself, which is great. Um, this also gives me a nice clean separation of modules because now I know in this setup where the different actual implementations are because I have this copy, reader, and writer, um, but they're completely separate. All I know is that they have this contract in the middle that is the interface. And so I can write my keyboard writer however I want, test it however I want, um, as long as I know that all that really matters is the fact that it implements reader. That's the externally facing API for it. This makes testing um, easier and actually possible with the copy module. Because again, now I have, um, now all that copy sees are the interfaces. It doesn't see the actual implementations. So that means if I want to test the uh, logic of how copy works, all I need to do is provide some test versions of a reader and a writer. So uh, what I'd end up with is some, some method like this. So I've written a test reader, and all it has is a string that I pass into it, and each time read is called, it'll, it'll shoot out another uh, character from that string. And a test writer, all it does is kind of like uh, hoovers up the different characters that are passed to it, and then I can assert later on what was actually written to it. So now, before my copy module, where I had to have my robot arm uh, reading, typing into a keyboard and then a scanner reading out from the printer, now I can actually test my copy module in just four lines of code. Uh, and then a lot along the same lines, you can also much more easily do debugging or development with uh, the dependency inversion principle. Um, for example, you might, well, just for the printer example, I don't want to have to, each time I work in the copy module, drag out my printer and waste paper. I want to just print out to a monitor. Uh, but in more practical terms, like in an application, maybe when you're developing uh, your server API, like you don't actually have access to your server in an airplane, well, you can create like a mock version of your server if you have an interface that you're actually at attacking, if you're not actually going out and making, having to make HTTP calls every time you want to go to the server. Um, or maybe you're on a like early startup and the server isn't even done yet. You can just write an interface that's like, these are the things that I expect the server to be able to do eventually. And you can already develop your app against the server that doesn't exist yet. Um, but I don't want to paint this as though like, this is all perfect and wonderful. There, it's, there's always drawbacks to like, any choice that you make. And the drawbacks are that it is more verbose and it's more complex. So it's like, you, know, you end up with this interface. You're having to define which implementation. If it turns out there's only ever one implementation that you're using, like it's not necessarily that important to actually do this. So you kind of only want to have that interface separation where necessary. Um, it's very easy to refactor code that had a concrete implementation. You can actually, in IntelliJ, just say extract an interface for it. So my general advice would be start with concrete implementations. And then the moment that you realize you do want to swap implementations in order to do some testing or in order to do um, like debugging or something like that, at that point, then you can extract the interface. It'll refactor all your code, and you'll, you'll get to the state. So that's, that's dependency. So dependency injection and dependency inversion are very closely related because they get you the same sort of um, benefits, but they're not exactly the same because dependency inversion is about how you kind of structure the code in order to take advantage of these like uh, contracts in the middle, these interfaces in the middle, whereas dependency injection is just how you get those dependencies to those, to those locations. 
So when you combine the two, then you end up with like, OK, I'm going to inject this dependency, and this dependency that I inject is going to be an interface. That's kind of why people tend to get these two mixed up. Uh, so you might be surprised that I've been talking up here for 15 minutes about dependency injection, and I haven't mentioned Dagger yet. Uh, or maybe I did briefly early on, but I haven't talked about how to use Dagger. And because that's surprising because, like, in, at least in the Android world right now, like, whenever people talk about dependency injection, they're talking about Dagger. Um, the fact of the matter is you don't need Dagger for dependency injection. Like, Dagger helps, and I'm about to go explain how Dagger works, but all the stuff I've talked, up, talked about up until now is just basic Java logic, and it doesn't require any dependency injection framework. Um, so if you want to use one, I'm going to talk about why you'd want to use one, but like I said, if, if you want to just tune out from the rest of this talk, that's totally fine because you can implement your own uh, daggerless dependency injection if you want. However, I prefer to use a framework for a couple of reasons. One is that uh, injection in these simple examples is fairly simple, or is fairly easy, but once you start getting um, ra a rather large graph of dependencies, it can be a lot of busy work. And one of the main things that these frameworks give you is the ability to like skip all of that busy work. It kind of does a lot of the wiring for you. Another advantage of actually using a framework is that it can add some extra logic that's very common in dependencies. So for example, you might have a singleton dependency. Uh, to go back to that HTTP pool, HTTP pool I was talking about earlier, uh, obviously you want to share that pool, so you might have a singleton HTTP pool somewhere in the middle of all that. Or another logic that you might want is lazy loading. Like you might have a rather large class that you don't want to have to initialize until the moment you need it. Uh, with a dependency injection framework, you can say, I would like this class to have this dependency, but I don't want you to actually uh, fully inject it until I need it. And then a third advantage is that it gives you a nice unified system for dependencies. Um, and this is, I think, a little underappreciated because um, pe you know, people all over your code might know how dependency injection works and think it's a pretty cool pattern, uh, but they each come up with their own pattern in their own individual part of the code, and suddenly you've got like 10 different ways to do dependency injection across your app. It's nice to have one unified system for it. And I mean, this is kind of the world of using libraries right now, because every library that has dependency injection kind of has to do it uh, in its own way. So there's a bunch of frameworks that you can choose from. Um, some of these are more like Java server-based and don't work as well on Android. The ones that, are, that uh, were written specifically for Android are Dagger. Um, not that they don't work outside of Android and they've been proven to be very useful outside of uh, Android. There used to be um, annotation processing slowdowns on Android, which is why people wrote Dagger, which had a lot of compile time uh, optimizations. So my talk is going to focus on Dagger 1, which may surprise people um, because I see that there is a Dagger 2, which sounds like better. It's one better than Dagger 1. Um, but the fact of the matter is I just know Dagger 1 a lot better, and I haven't, I haven't had a reason to upgrade to Dagger 2 yet because it's you know, some amount of work to upgrade. And I'd rather talk about something that I know a lot about than something I know very little about. Um, suffice to say, though, this, it's not actually like a huge upgrade from Dagger 1 to Dagger 2. And the things I'm going to be talking about are kind of like the basic utilities that a dependency injection framework give you. It's not like super advanced capabilities or something like that. And in fact, there's a talk uh, immediately after this one that is about Dagger 2 and all the really cool advanced stuff you, should do, you can do with that. So stick around if you want to get that. This will, this will cover things that like pretty much any dependency injection framework will get you. So Dagger, uh, if you didn't know, Dagger is called Dagger because it is based on directed acyclic graphs. So that means it's a graph of dependencies that doesn't have any cycles in it. Because it turns out if you have a cycle, it makes this, thing, this problem really hard to solve. Uh, so they just got rid of that. Uh, generally, you don't want cyclic dependencies because uh, where, it's like time travel. Where does everything start? Um, so you, uh, what, what happens with Dagger is you end up building what's known as an object graph. Um, so the object graph can have many starting points. Uh, and many ending points, but basically it's like you, you define like, okay, I have, I have a logger, I'm just gonna provide this, and then maybe I have some metrics, and the dependency injection framework will say like, okay, I, can, I know where this logger is, I'll grab the logger, and now I can, now I can also give you a metric because it gives you all this stuff. But let's start with a very simple object graph, the most simple object graph you can possibly start with, which is a single object. Uh, this isn't particularly interesting, except for just showing how the syntax works. So, uh, I've got my greeter class, which is going to uh, have a one method that says hello world. 
Uh, and the interesting thing here is that I've added this annotation um, at inject to the constructor. So what this is saying to Dagger is when I want an instance of greeter, this is the constructor I would like you to use for injection. So then the second component that I have is a module. So this is a separate class, and the module basically defines how the object graph is structured. And so in this case, I'm saying I have this module called my module, and it happens to have one item in it called greeter. And this is something that I, like, I provide as an injection point. So then somewhere in your code, you can call objectgraph.create. An object graph is uh, part of the API of Dagger, and you provide it a module. And with that object graph that's, re that's returned, you can then call, I want to get an instance of greeter. And then that greeter that's returned is the one that you, actually want, that you actually wanted to use. So this is kind of like the minimal example to get an object graph working that is injecting something for you. But like I said, it's not particularly interesting because there's, n there's no real dependencies right now. All it's doing is like getting an instance that you defined. Um, so let's add a very simple dependency. Just instead of uh, it saying hello world, instead we'll provide the text that it's going to be saying as a dependency. So now I'm going to have my class text. Um, again, I have uh, at inject some parameter list constructor here so that the uh, dagger object graph can grab it and create a new instance of it without having to go and get any dependencies. Uh, but now greeter is slightly different. Now greeter, what I have is a text instance inside of it that's passed into the constructor. And uh, I made that text final so that like, I know that what is happening is that this dependency that I require is being passed to me at construction time. That's really useful because then I know that once I have an instance of greeter, it's something I can immediately start using. Uh, and then the real key thing from Dagger's perspective is how, how all these injects annotations work together. So when I tell Dagger that I want an instance of greeter, it's going to go look at that uh, constructor and say, oh, I see that you want an instance of greeter, but in order to make that, I need an instance of text. And then it looks around its object graph for, does, some, does anyone have to inject text? Oh, look, that inject above defines where to create a text instance. So now it can put together all the pieces and get you an actual greeter. Um, and then uh, all, the, all the actual object graph create and getting all that stuff is the same from the last slide. And in your, in your uh, constructor injection, you can define as many uh, dependencies as you want. So you can have like a whole pile of dependencies if you want to inject it. It can, it can handle as many as you want. An alternative, if you want, is to, uh, instead of injecting it directly into the constructor, you can also annotate the field, uh, the actual member, mem member field. And again, uh, when you get an instance of it, it'll, it'll say, oh, here's this instance that I need to get the text into. OK, I know, I know where to get that. I can fill this in. And again, you can have add inject as many of these as you want. So they're just kind of two ways of doing the same thing. The usefulness of having um, inject annotated member fields is in case you have a constructor that isn't just, um, it isn't just a list of dependencies. So if you have a constructor that's like also taking some configuration on top of that, then you might need to take those variables in and then inject the dependencies later. Um, providers, so up until now, we've just been talking about dependency injection. Providers are uh, useful for doing de dependency inversion. Um, what providers do is before we were kind of just letting Dagger figure out the object graph on its own through the at inject annotation. It was finding all the constructors, it was figuring out how to put everything together. But providers are useful if you need to explicitly provide dependencies. That is, when someone asks for an instance of greeter or asks for an instance of text, I can say this is exactly what I would like you to use in that case. So for one thing, it gives you a greater control over the dependency. Because again, I can maybe configure the dependency slightly before passing it into the object graph. Um, it's very useful in the case where you can't annotate the dependency. So this is often the case where you're using a library, again, like OKHTTP, OK and I want to pass around a pool or I want to pass around a client all these places. Well, it doesn't have an annotated constructor because OKHTTP OK doesn't assume you're using Dagger. So I need to set up my own provides in order to say, here's where you get an OKHTTP OK client. Um, but then, on top of all this, this is where you can get that dependency inversion. Because if I've got my interface, um, like a reader or writer, it doesn't know what implementation I actually want to use there. 
So when you're able to explicitly provide, de de um, tell it what dependency to grab, then I can actually solve that problem. So an example of it um, for text and greeter would be in my module now, instead of um, just having it automatically figure out where everything is, I have these two methods now. And the key thing here is that it has this at provides on it. Um, the provides annotation then, set, then tells Dagger when it's compiling all its object graph together that it would like, whenever it's looking for an instance of text, this method will provide it. Um, and it doesn't actually need to be called provide text, that's just kind of like a practice that people do. What really matters is just the fact that there's a method that's annotated with provides and returns a particular object that you're looking for. And so now I can return you know, new text, and now the text itself doesn't even have to define what the text is going to be inside it. I can pass a string to it. And then um, lower down for greeter, I can say, oh, when you want to get an instance of greeter, here's the method. And much like constructor injection, this method now has one parameter that I'd like to take. And again, the object graph can look through and say, oh, do you have a copy of text? Oh, yeah, I, had, I do have a copy of text. It's, it's up above. So it can go through the graph and figure out how to get everything there. Um, so for the providing interfaces, I'm going to walk through an actual example of that. Um, again, with my reader writer example from earlier, I have this interface reader, and I have an implementation of it that's a keyboard reader. Um, but like I said, when you actually, when I in the code am saying I don't say inject a keyboard reader, I say I would like you to inject just a reader. But it doesn't know that the reader that you want is keyboard reader. That's where it provides comes in. But in my module now, I can say. When people are looking for an instance of reader, explicitly return an instance of keyboard reader. So this is really handy um, because now I can actually do that dependency inversion. And also, maybe in tests, uh, you can have a different module. And in that different ma module, what you return is like a test reader instead of a keyboard reader. Uh, so, so far, I've been talking about this setup if you have like a single module. Um, so imagine I have a single module that's like, I've got retrofit, which is doing all my REST calls, and OKHTTP, which is providing the HTTP layer for it. Um, single module is interesting, but it's more interesting if you can split things up into multiple modules. And this is nice because then uh, it's, it's, again, like you don't want to make your program that's just one huge Java class file. You want to have multiple different class files, multiple different packages. Splitting things up makes it easier to organize the code. So maybe instead now I have a REST module that's separate from the HTTP module. Uh, and it turns out that uh, Dagger has all these facilities for combining these into one major object graph for it. Um, you can do it either at compile time or runtime. At compile time, in the module annotation, you can say, uh, by the way, my REST module would also like to include an HTTP module because that it has some stuff that I need in order to, to operate. Um, at runtime, you can also do object graph.create and in include all of the modules you want in order. But there's a little bit of a warning here, which is that uh, it may blow up on you at this point. And the reason it may blow up is because uh, the object graph actually does some validation to make sure that the graph you created is consistent. That is, uh, if I'm asking for a reader, my object graph actually has an instance of reader to give to me. And so what, the reason why at runtime it might uh, be a little upset with you is because uh, it, doesn't know if, it doesn't know that this line exists if you're doing it at runtime. It just sees these two separate modules. And so at compile time, when it's trying to figure out, like, is this object graph actually legitimate, it's going to look at the HTTP module and it's going to say, wait a second, this OK HTTP dependency, it's never used. No one ever called for me to actually grab that. Um, and then likewise, in the REST module, it's going to say, wait a second, I have this retrofit instance and it needs OK HTTP, but I never got it from anywhere. No one ever told me where to get this from. Uh, so that's sort of the danger of having things at, at runtime. Uh, but luckily, Dagger has, think, has ways of getting around this, which is, uh, again, mo more module annotations. You can say, OK, my HTTP module, it's a library. It provides OK HTTP, and the key thing here is that it's a library, and I'm, that's me telling the system that I'm going to have some providers that it doesn't actually, that um, don't provide to anything right now, but trust me, it'll provide to something eventually. And then likewise, for my REST module, uh, even though it requires OK HTTP, which doesn't exist in the module, I can say that this module is not complete, that complete is false, that the things I need to build up all these objects haven't been provided yet, but I will provide them at runtime. Um, one big difference between Dagger 1 and Dagger 2 
is that Dagger 2 just makes it so that all modules are by default library true and complete false, which is, uh, I don't know, it kind of gives a, a little less uh, validation, but they kind of assume, rightfully so, that most of the time all you really care about is how your object graph operates as a whole. Um, some other Dagger features that exist, you have singletons, so if you only want a single item to be provided, you can add the at singleton annotation. Um, so that's really nice in the case that like you have an HTTP pool, you don't want it to pass around, uh, you don't want to keep duplicating each time. Um, before, in my you know, object graph, I'd get greeter, every time I'd call that, it would give me a new instance of greeter. Now if I do this, it handles all the logic for me, it only creates one instance of it. You can do lazy injecting with lazy injection, so uh, they add this lazy class, and so if instead of um, just saying I want to inject text, if I say I want to inject a lazy of text, then it gives me this lazy text back, which has a method in it that allows you to actually grab the dependency once you are going to use it. Uh, it also provides qualifiers, which are nice because you might have two objects that are actually the same class, but you want to have two different instances of it. So this has been really helpful in Trello because we have multiple um, HTTP clients that have different interceptors that we're using with them because like one of them wants to talk to the Trello server and it needs special like auth headers to talk to the server. Some of it's talking to like images just on the, webs on the web and like AWS is not happy if we're sending weird headers to it. So in that case it's useful to have qualifiers to say like this version is one that talks to Trello and this version of the client is one that talks to uh, images or just the world in general. So at this point you might be wondering, I thought I was at an Android conference and this guy hasn't mentioned Android once here. Um, so let me talk a bit about how you actually use Dagger on Android. Because there's a few little catches that happen here or there. Uh, the basic thing for adding Dagger is that you need to add it to your, uh, depend you need to add it as a compile time thing. Uh, but it's, it's actually in two pieces. Because what Dagger does is it compiles the object graph ahead of time for optimization and then at runtime, there's just a very small API for actually going in and grabbing all of, these, um, all of these things from the object graph. So typically what happens is you only want to provide your compiler because that means the compiler can do its thing to compiling but doesn't end up in your APK, as you do want to compile the um, actual app. If you want to do it actually correctly, you should look into the Android apt uh, plugin. And the Android app plugin uh, adds, instead of a provided dependency, it adds a apt dependency. And what that allows is for things to be used at compile time only, and it does not show up in your application in any way, shape, or form. Uh, the, the danger that can happen here if you don't use apt is that uh, though your dependency, if you use it as provided, means that in your code, you can still type code that actually accesses things in the compiler, um, whereas if you use apt, that stuff doesn't even show up in autocomplete. It only exists for, uh, it only exists at the time of comp compilation. Uh, and from as far, last I checked, I think with Dagger 2 you actually need Android app in order to get it working. Uh, Dagger plus ProGuard, this is kind of a sticky issue because Dagger uses a lot, Dagger 1 uses a lot of reflection. Um, my advice would be to Google ProGuard plus Dagger because people have written solutions to this um, of all the things that you need to do. Alternatively, you can use Dagger 2, which solves a lot of these uh, ProGuard problems because it uses, I believe, zero reflection to actually get anything done. Um, Android um, injection, for the most part, is the same, but there is one sticking point, which is that there's a lot of components in Android, like activities, services, and fragments, that you are not actually controlling the construction of. Um, like the activity, you never just call new activity. You don't call new service. You ask the the uh, framework to start an activity, or actually framework to start a service. Or with fragments, yes, sometimes you call a new instance, uh, but if the configuration changes and the fragment needs, needs to get recreated, then the framework again is the one actually creating the, the thing. So you don't control the, control the constructor there. The question is, how do you get constructor injection? Um, and the solution here is that you can, there's a method called object graph inject that allows you to inject your object at any given time. So if I have some activity with a dependency, so I've got my, my fancy dependency. I can say in on create to uh, get a copy of my object graph. So 
Uh, in this case, I'm just going to store the object graph in the application. You can come up with your own solutions for where you want to store the object graph. Um, and then once you have your object graph, you can call inject this, and it'll actually put that dependency into your activity. So this is a fairly common pattern with things that the Android framework creates that you don't actually control. Um, a really good sample project that I highly recommend anyone who's getting into Dagger to look at is U2020, which was uh, uh, one of Jake Wharton's sample apps and was actually written by him for a talk about Dagger. So this is kind of like the perfect situation. Um, if you're wondering about the name, that's the Unicode character for Dagger. So that's why U2020. It has this cool injector pattern for um, actually injecting object graphs via the context, which is a kind of very nifty way to get your object graphs into your system. Uh, and you can find it on GitHub. You can also just Google U2020. It's very easy to find. Um, and I'll put up these slides later if people want to see it. Anyways, that's all I had to say about dependency injection. So thanks for coming out and listening to that. Uh, does anyone ha we have time for questions if anyone wants to ask anything. So the question was like, why not upgrade from Dagger 1 to Dagger 2, mostly? Um, I would say, well, the main thing for me is actually has to do more with refactoring, which is that uh, refactoring is a surprisingly high cost in development. And it's very easy to get in this process where you just as a programmer, it feels really good to refactor code, but it doesn't necessarily actually get you anything new. Um, and the advantages that Dagger 2 were going to give us were minimal. Because yes, one of the things it does is it doesn't use reflection anymore, which means it's a little bit faster. I think when I was reading, it's about like 15% faster than Dagger 1, um, which is really cool. But we don't spend most of our time injecting dependencies on an Android app. Like We create an activity, and then we inject some dependencies, and we're done. Like it, that matters a lot more if you're like running some gigantic server and creating new, like every new request that comes in, you're injecting and you're trying to do thousands of requests a second. So that sort of performance matters there. It doesn't matter as much to us. Um, also, Dagger 2 uh, has sort of a slightly more academic view to how uh, graphs should be set up. So for example, I didn't go over it now because I didn't want to uh, I didn't want to talk about things that Dagger 1 has that Dagger 2 doesn't that would make it hard to upgrade from one to the other. But one thing that Dagger 1 does allow is overrides. So you can say that like my module has like a reader, um, and then in my application it provides a keyboard reader. But then in my test I can say, I'm going to take that module, and I'm going to override what it's providing. Now I'm going to, instead of saying I have two different modules and I'm going to access two different ones, instead I'm going to say I have one module and then I'm going to put another module on top of that overrides. And we're using that setup right now. And if we were to switch to Dagger 2, we'd have to restructure our modules such that we don't actually use overrides, which might be a worthy goal at some point for improving the architecture of our general app. But at the moment, like again, refactoring is expensive. It doesn't actually get us anything. So that's the main reasons we haven't upgraded yet. But there's certainly like reasons to upgrade. Um, like I think another major difference is that Dagger 2 has a lot better scoping stuff that you can do, like much more advanced scoping. So if we were doing some really advanced stuff with scoping, then it would be like handy to have Dagger 2, but we're also not doing that. So those are the main reasons. Uh, you in the back? Uh, so sometimes you have to use field injection, right? Have to use what? Field injection. Uh, yes. For, well, for, for like when you have like an Android activity that you don't actually control the constructor on. Uh, you could do that. I like, I, I like doing constructor injection when possible, because then I can, very, I can say very upfront, these are the dependencies that this class depends on right here. And um, it actually makes testing a lot easier, because in your tests, you might be tempted to use Dagger to inject um, the, all the dependencies for like, constructing your test objects. But if you have everything as like, a constructor injection, you're not depending on some like, magical set setter happening from the outside, you can actually just avoid like, your whole Dagger stuff in the test entirely. So if I'm testing like, my class with dependencies A and B, I can, just create my, I can just create all of that in a setup before the test runs. Um, whereas if I was doing field injection, I would have to like, provide a way to do, I'd have to provide both ways then. Um, so 
but yeah, the main the main reason is because it just makes my logic it makes my logic in my head a lot easier to know that, that like this is the actual list of dependencies I need right off the bat. And there was another question in the back. Uh, I don't have any great tips tips about that. The main the main thing that I really like doing these days is um, having a module that's public in a package, and then having interfaces in that same package that are like defining the sort of things that the module provides, but then actually hiding the implementations. So those are just package private. And uh, the cool setup of that then is I, I kind of structure things as like, here's a series of modules coming together to provide all these interfaces that actually run my application. Uh, but then it purposely prevents me from actually being able to uh, hardwire anything of my code to a specific implementation. Like it forces me to have good architecture. Uh, so that's something that I've been enjoying recently. But generally, but generally that means it's like fe feature by feature kind of has its own module because it's not hard to combine modules together. Was there a question over there? The question was, if you were to set up your own dependency injector, how would you do it? Um, my answer is I, I wouldn't <laughs> just because I don't want to go through that work. Um, I think more, more what I was implying is that like on a small scale, you can just do it all by hand. Um, and if for me, it's not an interesting problem to write my own dependency injector because they already exist. So um, I think other people have had talks about how to write um, a dependency injector, and that's a useful skill to have if you want to understand exactly what's going on under the hood. But like, yeah, I've never done it myself. So, so the question was, if I'm, if I'm doing all modules that like provide uh, hidden implementations, does that mean that all of my modules are library equals true? Pretty much yes. And also, an another thing to note there is that uh, you might be thinking, well, wait, if I have my uh, implementations private, how do I test them? Well, if the, if the tests are in the same package as the, as the actual implementation, then you can test the implementation in that package. You can then have access to all those things that are packaged private. Any other questions? Cool, that takes us just about to the end, so have a nice day.